And I'd like to introduce tonight's main speaker, Jack G. from Huntington Beach. I got gum. See, I took my gum out. Uh, I'm Jack. I'm an alcoholic. Uh, and it's really good to be here and just, you know, walk in and you see people you know and you're smiling, everyone's laughing, you know, and you see people that are still sober from the last time you were here and, uh, and it really feels good and, uh, and it was great to come down here with Doug and uh, I'd rather talk about my Marlin than talk about my story, but uh, uh, I will real quick. It was my first day fishing. I'd never even been out, you know what I mean, on a boat and they give me a one day license and I end up catching this 245 pound marlin. It was like the second biggest fish out there off Catalina. And uh, anyway, and so, and I was like, hey, everybody does this, huh? You know, it's like I was just clueless, man. I had no, you know, I mean, I had no frame of reference. I'll probably spend the next 20 years trying to get something else like it never again. But anyway, uh, whatever. I started drinking when I was nine. And, uh, you know, I came from a family, uh, five kids, and, and, and I'm going to jump into my daughter right now. I, I, I spoke at a meeting in Santa Barbara on Friday night. And, uh, you know, I'm talking about my kid. I'm always talking about my kids, right? And, and so I come home, and I'm driving home, and I'm, I'm pulling up right by my house, and there's like four cop cars out by my house. I'm going, whoa, what's going on? You know, I'm like just pulling into the house, right? And, and I pull up into my alley, and I just see these little kids just like scurrying away from the car like little rats, right? And, uh, and I look over, and one of them's my 14-year-old, and she's stashing a bag down in the bushes, right? And I, I go, what's up? And... Uh, you know, I go, I go, what, what are you putting in the bushes, man? And she goes, oh, just uh, somebody's stuff. Don't worry about that. The cops are assholes. And it's like, <laughs> I'm like, God, man, you know. And what am I going to say, right? You know, it's like, yeah, okay, they are assholes, but what are you putting in the bushes? And, uh, you know, whatever. She's hiding tall cans in the bushes. And, uh, man, uh, she had her first drunk a while back. And, um, you know, she's 14 years old, had her first drunk. And I get a call from her mom. And, uh. You know, and her mom says, hey, and it's a late night call. You know, it's one of those calls you get. And I'm thinking, oh, my God, somebody's dead. You know, another one of those calls, right? And, uh, and they say, hey, you know, we just picked up your daughter. She didn't know her own name. She'd been beaten up, you know, bruised all over the place. They didn't know what she was on. You know, we just picked her up. And I'm like, fuck, man. And, uh, you know, and she doesn't call me for a couple of days because she's nervous, right? You know, it, it, I've always been real cool to her, but she knows I'm on the program, right? And, uh, and so I talked to her a couple of days later, and I said, well, what happened? You know, what, what, you made a bad choice, I guess. What, what happened? And, uh, and she goes, yeah, you know, we were drinking. And, of course, what they were drinking is everything. You know what I mean? I knew it was bad. It's like, well, one guy had the Canadian club. The other guy had the beer, and they're mixing it. You know, whatever they could get out of their parents' closet. You know what I mean? That kind of trip. And, uh, and anyway, I said, well, what happened? I go, I go, how'd you get beat up? She goes, I don't know. And I go, would you black out or did you pass out? What's the deal? You know, and she goes, well, I don't know. And I go, well, this is what I learned. When you pass out, that means body and brain, boom, done, down. Both are on the ground, over. I go, when you black out, brain's on the ground, body's still going. And she goes, oh, blackout, Dad. And uh, <laughs> So, you know, whatever. My daughter's first drunk's a blackout drunk, you know. And, uh, and I'll tell you, you know, the sad thing is I, I wanted to kill myself. When, when that happened, when I heard that, her going through that, I, I mean, I was done. It was days of, of calling my sponsor and just freaking out, and I wanted to kill myself. Because to her, it's a blackout drunk. To me, it's 82 people dead now instead of 81, because that's what I think. I got sober on, on January 8th of 1989, and in that amount of time, since then, I've lost 80 friends to this disease. I just went on a six-week trip, and on the last three weeks of the trip, I lost three friends. One of my friends was murdered in an alley in Anaheim. They shot him in the head over a drug deal. Another one of my friends was in France getting a kidney transplant. They went bad. He died. And another one was in New York, and he died, and they still don't know why. And, uh, and that was in that short term. So I look at her taking one drink. She thinks it's fun. You know, hey, one drink. And I look at her selling her ass. You know what I mean? I look at her shooting dope. I look at her coming down with hep C, all that stuff that goes behind this disease, man. And, uh, and I tell you, I, I wanted to die. I just thought to myself, I cannot face this. And some guy on the program comes up to me after me talking about it. He says, you need to get thicker skin. You know what? And I almost punched the guy out, man. And uh, I didn't come to Alcoholics Anonymous to get thicker skin. I had thick skin when I was out there. When I was drinking, I didn't want that little girl around me. You know what I'm saying? I'd gotten her mom pregnant, you know, and just moved her into my mom's house. No big deal. You know, hey, move in. You know what I'm saying? It's like I lived with my mom. What? Are you pregnant? Okay, come on. You know, and uh, <laughs> so I moved her in, and, and my friend Felicia's here. And, and at the same time, I had a pregnant girl living in my house. I married Felicia's 14-year-old friend, and, uh, and, and that was what was going on. 
you know, and, and this, that insanity. I'd come home drunk. I'd come home late at night after being with her, and, uh, and I'd come back, and the girl, the pregnant girl at the house would start screaming about it, and we'd get in a fist fight. She'd be eight and nine months pregnant, and we'd be slugging it out in the house. I put that lady through hell. When she went to have her kid, I didn't go down to the hospital because I wanted to be there for the baby. I went down to the hospital because some guys were trying to kill me, and while I was down there, the baby was being born. That's why I was down at the hospital, and it was complete insanity. And I didn't want that little girl around me when I was drinking. I didn't want her by me. You know, I got something else going on. But the trouble was, after I'd been drinking 3 or 4 o'clock in the morning, right, and the booze starts wearing off and the cocaine starts wearing off, all of a sudden I get that remorse that comes over us, and I want to see the baby. You know, I'm saying, hey, I want to see the baby, you know. So, so I go over to the apartment, right, and they're in an apartment. By that time, I go over in the apartment, pound on the door, kick in the door, threaten everybody in the house, Three or four of the clock in the morning, smelling like booze, blood coming out of me from fighting. I'd wander in there, threaten everybody in the apartment, get that little baby out of her crib. She'd start screaming. The whole house is just going nuts, screaming, right? I'm threatening everybody. And I get that little baby in my arms, and I just hold that little baby and rock her. Because at the time, she was the only person left that didn't hate me. And I'd hold that little baby in my arms until I'd pass out, and they'd call the cops on me. That's what was going on when I was drinking. I had turned into an animal when I was out there. And... uh you know, like I said, I took my first drink when I was nine years old. I came from a family where there was a lot of physical and sexual abuse. Um, I had a father that was like the great Santini. I don't know if you guys ever seen that movie. He was a career Navy guy, and I used to have to salute him when I was a kid when he came home, you know, and uh, it's like he'd come home, and I'm like, Jack Grisham reporting for inspection, sir, you know, and, uh, and he'd come in and check my house, and my dad was a drunk, and I liked seeing my dad drunk. Like, like some people say, hey, I don't like seeing my parents drunk. I like seeing my dad drunk. My dad was a vicious man. Right? He was a violent man, and I liked seeing him drunk. We'd be in that house. There were five of us little kids, and we'd be hiding in that house, right? And my dad had come home, and I'd hear the keys. Like, he couldn't get the keys in the door. It's like, yeah, he's hammered, man. You know, and, and he'd get, you know, I'd hear him sliding around, right? And the door would open. He'd come in. He'd go, hey, what's up, punk? Want money? You know, and he's like throwing money and staggering. And he goes and lays down. See, I like seeing my dad drunk. When my dad came home sober, his job sucked. His wife was a bitch. His kids sucked. And somebody's getting their ass kicked, you know? And uh, like the book says, my dad was a hail fellow, well-met kind of drunk guy. You know what I'm saying? And I like seeing him drunk. And later on, that's what I turned out to be. You like seeing me drunk. I mean, maybe you didn't like seeing it, but you like seeing me drunk more than you like seeing me sober. Because sober, I was angry. You know, it was like one of those little tigers you see on TV, you know what I mean? And they go like, they shoot him with a dart, and then they go like sex check him or whatever they're doing, you know what I'm saying? And, and the tiger just lays there, and it's okay because it's tranquilized, right? But you never see any of those guys sex checking tigers when they haven't been shot with something first, man. And, uh, and that was my bag, you know? As long as you got something in me, you can do whatever you want, right? You know, and, uh, but don't come up when I'm sober. And, uh, and that, you know, that's what was going on. I got my first arrest when I was 13 years old, and uh, I got arrested 30-something times since then. And... Uh, you know, for all sorts of stuff, and thank God they didn't catch me for the stuff that I should have been caught for, you know, or I'd be in jail for the rest of my life, man. You know, uh, you know, kidnapping, you know, rape, burglary, all that, you know, all that stuff that goes behind drinking I was doing since I was a little kid, man. And, uh, you know, just all that crap, and thank God I didn't get caught for all that stuff, but a ton of arrests. You know, I got kicked out of a ton of schools. And, and besides being an alcoholic, I'm a full-blown hypochondriac. Every disease that comes out, I've got, and... Uh, you know, I think about it like when the Filipino swine thing was going on, right? It's like I'm in the market and I got a neck ache and I'm thinking, oh my God, I was standing next to that Filipino guy at the counter, man. You know, it's like, you know, you know I've already been down for anthrax, whatever, everything that comes out. And, uh, and Doug mentioned those films, right? And, and they used to show those films to us in school. I don't know if they still show them, but they, they like get all the kids and they herd them over to the auditorium, right? You know, and, and then they start showing these films and a doctor comes out and he says, if you drink, your liver will blow out the side, you know, and, and if you smoke pot, you won't be able to breathe, and if you take acid, you will think you're an orange forever, you know, and, you know, it's like, and you, you just sit there freaking, and, uh, and I remember seeing those films, right, and, 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 this, and I'll tell you the first time, you know, we come around here, and we don't think we're alcoholics, right, and you, you say, you know, you hear this stuff about relapse, and compulsion, obsession, it's like, yeah, right, bro, you know what I mean, it's like, whatever, and, uh, and I remember they said that to me, but I thought back of the first time I ever had that compulsion or that obsession, and I was thinking when it was, right? And I remember when it was. I was a kid. I was about 13 years old, and I went to a party. By this time, I was a little surfer kid. You know, I got my hair down to here. I was like, what's up, bro? A little Spicoli kid. And, uh, and I go to this party, and, you know, they break out the Pam, right? 
Cunning, baffling, and powerful, alcohol disguised itself as Pam vegetable shortening and went to a party. And uh, <laughs> so they're spraying it in a bag, right? And I'm like, what's up? What are you doing, man? You know, it's like, we're doing this. And I said, well, can I get down? And uh, yeah, so, so I get the bag and I'm like, <sighs> you know, I'm going like the walls, you know, the walls are going like, oh, whoa, whoa. And I'm like backing up for a second. You know, I don't like this, man. And, you know, the walls are going and I'm standing there and it, it wears off a little bit. And I go, can I get another? And, uh, <laughs> So I got another, and I got another, and another, and another, and I finished off that can of Pam, and, uh, and then I thought, mom's got Pam, and uh, so, <laughs> so I took off to my mom's house, and I broke out my mom's can of Pam, and I finished that can off, and, uh, and then the obsession and the compulsion had definitely kicked in. It's 10.30 at night, and I'm on a Pam run, and uh, I'm going down the street, knocking on doors, going, yeah, my mom's baking cookies, got any Pam, and... Uh, <laughs> So whatever, that was a two-week run, and, uh, and I'm still, like, twitching from it now. But uh, anyway, that was a two-week run, and then I'm in health class, right? And here's where the, the hypochondriac bit kicks in, right? I'm in health class, and they're showing one of these films. And today's film is Inhalant's film, right? And it's like little shrinking brains and all that. And I'm like, you know, just sweating in my seat, right? And they stop the film, and they go, any questions? And I go, yeah, my hand goes right up, right? And I did my very first fourth and fifth step. I go, I've been doing Pam and I can't stop, man. <laughs> and, uh, so whatever, uh, it didn't stop me. But anyway, so I, I think back and I had to have that compulsion. I got in a lot of trouble. I had that zero self-esteem deal going on. Not low self-esteem, zero self-esteem. I mean, it's just, you know, I, you know, the physical abuse and the sex stuff when, when I was a kid, man, it, it, you know, it did some damage there. And, uh, you know, a lot of that, and, and I just didn't like myself, and I knew what I was. I'd been told I was trash my whole life. You know, you're a scumbag, you're trash. You know, and, uh, and if you liked me, you were stupid. And I knew you were stupid, and I made you pay for it. You know, anybody that liked me, I burned. You know what I mean? Those people I burned, and the people that didn't like me, those were always the ones I was attracted to. They knew the truth about me, I thought. This guy knows the truth. You know what I mean? It's the other ones that didn't. I screwed up in a lot of schools, a lot of arrests, like I said, and, uh, and I felt better when I was drinking. I felt better when I had a couple pills in me, you know, and uh, and so I drank all the time. I drank more and more, and I destroyed anything that came good for me. You know, I was good in, in sports and school, so I just quit going. You know, I was in a band that was doing real good, so I just quit going. You know, I mean, I just walk away from everything. That's what I did, you know, and just destroyed it. And uh, anyway, my father died in 1984, and when my dad died, that was it. I was done. That was the last person that had any control over me. You know, you come from a family that's got that kind of, like, dad going on and that kind of beating, man, and... Uh, and nothing mattered except for him. It's like I remember I'd get in trouble at school, and they'd say, we're going to expel you. I'd say, get down. You know, go ahead. What are you going to do? Give me a little swat. Get, go on. I'm going to get home and get tied up and beaten with Hot Wheel tracks, man. You, go on. You know, a little smack, you know. And the same with the police. It's like I remember the first time I turned 18, I got arrested on a charge, and I, I pled guilty. You know what I mean? I didn't call nobody. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like I'm just going to stay for court and plead guilty. I don't want to see my dad after this, man. And, uh, <laughs> And my buddy goes, really? Should I plead guilty too? I go, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> so, uh, and I'll tell you, you know, county was not fun back then with half black, half white hair. But anyway, so, uh, and I remember, but I was, I was more willing to go to jail than face my dad. And I remember a couple days after I was in there, I get a visitor, it's him. You know, and he said, hey, man, why didn't you call me? I would have got you out of this and we could have straightened it up at home. You know, and I said, no, <laughs> you know, I'm going to hang out and eat bad bologna sandwiches. I'll catch you in a couple of weeks, man, you know, and uh, and he goes, I'll be here to pick you up, then we'll straighten it out. So, uh, so I got time and got my ass kicked. But, uh, but the bottom line is, I was more willing to go to jail than to face that guy. And, uh, and when he died, that was it. No one's left in charge of me anymore. What are you going to do? You know, I mean, I was beating on my mom, beating on my family, you know, constant arrest, beating on all my friends. You know, that little kid, that little raped and abused kid, it turned into a six foot three, 220 pound animal. That's what I was a violent, vicious, cowardly animal. That's what I had become on this program, uh, before this program. And uh, I've become on a, this program, too, sometimes. But uh, <laughs> anyway, and I'll tell you how I got here, right? So I'm married to the 14-year-old. I got that going on. And her dad was a psycho Vietnam vet guy that was trying to kill me weekly, right, Felicia? I mean, it, like a weekly deal. And, and the cops were at my house on a daily basis, you know. And I was on the one-day-at-a-time program before I ever knew that, what that was. I had a noose over my bed. Right? And, and I had a pull-up bar to do some, I was going to work out, right? So I'd put, I, I had done a pull-up bar, and then, you know, I, I did install the bar, but I didn't do any pull-ups. But I, it was a good place to hang the noose. And, uh, and every morning, I was on the one-day-at-a-time program without ever knowing. It's like I'd wake up, and the first word out of my mouth would be, fuck. 
You know what I mean? When you're coming to, it's like, fuck, man. And I'd look up and I'd see the noose and I'd go, should I hang myself? I'll go one more day. And then I, that's what I was doing. And, uh, and so I got the pregnant girl going on. I got the baby over in this house. I got the 14 year old I married. I got the in and out of jail. Bam, bam, bam. Drinking. I felt better when I was drinking. A friend of mine gets busted out in front of my mother's house. I used to say my house. It's my mother's house. I lived with my mother forever. And, uh, <laughs> and, and somebody just reminded me. I'm always getting reminded about something. And somebody comes up to me the other day and goes, Hey, I heard you used to live in a tent inside your mom's house. And, uh, <laughs> and I did for a while. I lived in a tent in my mother's house. I guess I wanted to get away, but didn't really want to get away. So, <laughs> so <laughs> whatever. I mean, I, I got a friend from the neighborhood here, and he'll attest to all of this. So, uh, Anyway, just a complete insanity. So here's how I get to the program. A friend of mine gets arrested out in front of the house, right? So I'm in there in the afternoon, and I, you know, I'm in one of those things. I don't come out till the sun goes down. You know, I'm watching cartoons, right? And, and so my buddy gets arrested. And my mom goes, hey, hey, Fitzy, Fitzy's going down outside. I go, what? She goes, Fitzy, your buddy Fitzy's going down. So, uh, so I peep out, and there's Fitz going to jail, right? And, uh, and let me tell you about Fitz. He's like, he was a cute little guy. But he's not as cute now, but back then he was cute. He, he had like the curly blonde hair and like the freckles. He looked like a little puppet, like a little howdy doody puppet, right? So Fitz was not going to do well in county, if you know what I'm saying. So, so it's like, yeah, he's going down, right? So good. So he goes, bye-bye. So while he's down, I'm getting more arrests, more insanity, more drunkenness, more fights, more sp slow speed car wrecks, you know, and, uh, ne you know, never fast ones. It was always like, I got it. I got it. You know, just, you know, I'm ramming into a tree or something and, uh, whatever. So all that stuff. So Fitz goes back and he goes and he goes and he pleads, I have a disease, right? And they send him to rehabilitation, right? Please don't give me a hard time. I have a disease. And, uh, and they give him rehabilitation, right? So he comes home from rehabilitation with this, Walking hand in hand with Bill, Bob, and Jesus trip. You know what I mean? What, the, the whole thing, it's like, you know what? That guy that just gets clean, right? And then he's going to save the neighborhood, right? He comes back. And, uh, and so who does he come to first? It's me. It's like, hey, what's up, bro? You got a problem, man. <laughs> I go, what? I go, you got the problem, champ. I saw you go down, man. And, uh, and he goes, come to a meeting. I'm like, why? Why do I got to go? He goes, come to a meeting with me. Come to me. You got a problem, right? And for some reason, I had a little moment of clarity. Like, I thought to myself, well, okay, like, how often have I been drunk lately? You know what I mean? Or high or whatever. And I thought, well, every day. Every day, as far as I can remember, right? So I said, okay, I'll go. And I went to the meeting. And the place I went to was a rap center in downtown Long Beach, right? And uh, <laughs> our friend's been there. And uh, <laughs> anyway, and it was the kind of place where, like, most of the women didn't have all their teeth and shit, right? It's like, you know. <laughs> And I was, like, stoked if she had teeth. I was, oh, no way, she's got, like, three up front. You know, it's like I <laughs> walked in, you, you know, you push your shopping cart up outside and go to the meeting. And, and, and I remember I walked into that meeting, uh, loser, scumbag, faggot, uh, know that guy from school, you know, and just ripped you all apart, and I'm not like you. And I'll tell you why I'm not like you. I feel better when I'm drinking, man. You know what I'm saying? I feel better when I got something in me. I like you when I'm drinking. You know what I mean? You put a drink in me, and I like you. You know what I mean? I, I, hey, you know what I'm saying? A drink and a pill, it's like my favorite drink was V&V, &V, vodka and Valiums, man. And, and <laughs> You know what? You put a drink and a pill in me, I, I, I want to give you a big hug. <laughs> yeah? You put a drink, a pill, and a line of cocaine in me, and I want to start a business with you, man. And, <laughs> and you take that out of me, and I want you dead. And I want you dead now. And what somebody de did is they should have grilled me. It's like I always grill guys now. Like I see guys come in, I don't let them just come in. You know what I mean? I grill him. I find out, well, what are you doing here, man? You know, and, and I ask him, and I wish someone would have grilled me. Because what they could have said is, hey, man, why don't you read the doctor's opinion? Because in the doctor's opinion, they talk about you. They talk about a person that gets a sense of ease and comfort, which comes at once from taking that first drink. And that's what I had. I took the drink. I feel better, man, the minute I took it. And I didn't even need to take it. The thought of taking a drink made me feel better. And I mean, think about, and the people in this room that have done other stuff, think about when they're coming by. You know what I'm saying? It's like, hey, somebody's coming over. You know what I mean? You already feel better knowing they're coming over, right? <laughs> like, and you haven't done a damn thing. And, uh, and that's how I feel. I'd be all stressed out, you know, just totally just freaking, you know, blisters on my fingers, just stressed. All of a sudden, I'd think drink. And it's like, oh, bye. Bye-bye. And I'd leave. And I'd go up to the liquor store, and I'd get my vodka from the liquor store, right? And the guy would set it down, and he'd wink at me. I'd wink at him. You know, we'd smile, and it's going to be okay, man. You know? 
And I'd walk outside and I'd take that first drink. And when it hit me, it was like being touched by God. A warm hug that just said, Jack, it's going to be okay. It's okay. And I thought to myself, how can I be an alcoholic if that's how booze makes me feel, man? I'm not an alcoholic. I'm married to a 14-year-old, bro. That's my problem. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like I'm not an alcoholic. I live at my mom's, man. You know what I'm saying? It's like, it's like I didn't understand. But I went out and I tried to stop on my own, you know, and, and I came in and out. I was one of those in and out guys, right? But I'm not really an alcoholic, right? So I'm just kind of in and out, in and out, one of those guys. And, uh, and I remember one day I had 30 days. I got 30 days, 30 solid days on my own. No meetings, no nothing, 30 days. And on my 30th day, I got a job as a bartender. I thought that'd be a good job. And uh, and on my way to work, I stopped by to pick up some mushrooms for a friend. And uh, and I'm at this guy's house, and I'm sitting there bragging to him about how sober I am. I'm sitting on the couch with Lester, and uh, and we're sitting there, you know, and I'm going, oh, dude, it's good. You know, it's sober, man. I got a job. The 14-year-old's gone, man. Everything's good. You know, boom, it's my first day. I'm going down the job. Is that your bong? Oh, bam. Cunning, baffling, and powerful. Alcohol disguised itself as a skunk bud and hid in this guy's bong, man. And uh, So I reached out and I thought, bam, I took a hit with no nothing. Just that's the bong. Boom, I'm taking a hit. And then I take a hit and I thought, oh, my God, I just took a hit of weed. See, I didn't know that Bill Wilson had done this back in the 30s. Same deal. No one had pointed it out. I'd never heard any of the tapes. It didn't happen to be with weed. It was booze, but it was the same thing. He was sitting with another guy, bragging about how sober he was, reached out, and bam, he took a drink. And that was my story. All the way in the 80s, way past him. Gone, he's been dead, and I did the same thing. I'm at a guy's house bragging about how sober I am, and I reached out, and it wasn't a drink. It was a bong hit, but it was the same deal. I'm bragging about being sober, and boom, I'm gone. And I thought, oh, my God, I just took a bong hit. Well, I'm not going back to those meetings on one bong hit. You know what I'm saying? It's like, like I'm not, hey, yeah, I'm back. I took a bong hit. I'm back, bro. You know what I mean? It's like... It's like, I'm going. You know what I'm saying? It's like, I'm not, hey, I blew it. So let's have a drink. And uh, so I got a drink and I'm smoking some weed. Well, since I'm smoking weed and drinking, I might as well be eating a gram of shrooms too. And uh, so I eat a gram and I hang out and I smoke some more weed and I drink and I'm not coming on. So I eat another gram and, uh, and I smoke a little more weed and drink. And I tell the guy, hey, look, man, I got to get out of here. It's my first day at work, man. I got to go. And uh, so... So I walk out to the car, right? And, uh, and, you know, I'm still not coming on. I put on some weight, so I eat another gram. And, uh, and then I drive all the way to work, and I'm still not coming on. So I eat two more grams. I finish the bag, and, uh, and I go into work. I introduce myself as the new guy, and, uh, and I'm back cutting up some limes. And I think he burned me. Some bitch burned me. I go, I got to use a phone, man. So I take off and use the phone. I call this guy up. I go, you burned me, bro. He goes, what? I go, you burned me, man. Those mushrooms are no good. He goes, what do you mean they're no good? I go, I ate that whole bag. I ain't coming on. And he goes, hey, man, he goes, you just left my house like 15 or 20 minutes ago, champ. And you know, like when you're smoking weed, sometimes you think you've been there way longer than you have. It's like, it's like, oh, I've been here forever, man. You know, it's like, so I had lost track of time somehow. And, uh, and I go, oh, uh, okay, I got to go. And, and I hung the phone up. And when I hung the phone up, that hard black plastic phone bent right in the middle <laughs> And it flipped over and it grabbed that receiver and it made the happiest little rubber sound you ever heard in your life and went, thwack. I go, oh my God. <laughs> I go, I'm done, man. And uh, anyway, so I went out and started pouring drinks. And, uh, and I was pouring a drink for Carl Lewis, the sprinter guy. You've seen him on TV, Carl Lewis, right? And uh, so Carl comes up and I go, hey, Carl, what's up, man? He goes, I'm not Carl. I go, come on, bro, I'm cool. And, uh, and to tell you the truth, he might have even been white. I have no idea, man. You know, <laughs> and it's like I go, I go, hey, Carl, what's up, man? He goes, I'm not Carl, man. And I go, all right, hey, bro. And I'm thinking, you know what? All right, I understand that Carl doesn't want you guys to know he's Carl because that's a hassle. You know what I'm saying? It's a hassle. He's got people bugging him and stuff. But Carl should understand that I am cool enough to know that Carl is Carl, and Carl better admit to being Carl or he's getting his ass kicked, man. And, uh, <laughs> So Carl won't admit it, right? And I, I go, come on, Carl. He goes, just give me my drink, man. I go, you want your drink, bro? You want your drink? There's your drink. So I take the drink and chuck it at Carl, right? Now, I'm watching the drink come out of the cup real slow towards <laughs> Carl. And it hits Carl in the face. Now, alcoholics, we're quick-thinking people, right? In that split second, it hits Carl in the face. I go, whoa. Maybe that's not Carl Lewis. <laughs> Because if that was Carl Lewis, he would have moved way faster than that. And uh, anyway, I was fired. And a uh, <laughs> little scuffle with Carl, then a firing. And uh, so they fired. I'd been on the job, what, an hour at the time? <laughs> anyway, so, 
Anyway, I was fired. I ended up on the street, right? And one of these loser guys from AA that I had seen, seen me popping in and out. He got me home. You know, the whole deal, right? So the next day, we're talking on the phone. Now, he's an AA guy, and he saw me drunk, really drunk. So we're talking on the phone, but he's not bringing it up. And I remember talking to him, and he's not bringing it up, right? And I'm thinking, man, what, you know, what's the deal here? You know, and, and I'm like, we're talking, he's not bringing it up. I said, so, uh, you know, I, I, I was pretty hammered last night, huh? And he goes, yeah. He laughs. He doesn't say anything. I go, hey, uh, you know, I was pretty hammered last night, huh? And he goes, yeah. What I was waiting for was, Jack, you're a loser. Jack, you're a scumbag. You're a piece of crap, loser. You killed your dad. I was blamed for my dad's death when he died. Killed your dad, killing your mom, married to a 14-year-old, loser, scumbag, loser. I'd heard it my whole life. And I'm waiting to hear from Mr. AA, Mr. Don't Drink AA guy. And it ain't coming. And I said, well, you know what, man? I, I was pretty hammered. And he goes, yeah. He goes, you know what? He goes, you're probably an alcoholic. And he goes, and if you are an alcoholic, you can't stop drinking. And if you do stop, you can't stay stopped on your own power. And that was the first time in my life that I'd ever heard that. And I wish to say that that guy was still here, but two weeks after that relapse of mine, he went out and shot heroin for the first time and died in the car. And, uh, and that, that was on November 15th of 1988, and since then it's been 80 friends dead. And, uh, but that guy taught me a lot. And one of the things he taught me was that, like Doug was saying, that this desire's got to come from God. You know, and, and I love this thing into the wives, you know, and, and if you're new, if you're new around here, get the book and read it. Don't like just take orders from people and do it because they say, you know what I'm saying? Get the book and find out what's going on around here. When you come in and you say you're an alcoholic, find out what you're copping to, man. You know what I'm saying? It's like, <laughs> there's a lot involved. I mean, you may not want be one of us and you might have a way out, you know, and, uh, <laughs> you know, find out what you're copping to. Get involved in the book, man. And I love this part, into the wives. There's a little chapter into the wives. And what it says in that little paragraph, it says when we're dealing with a new guy, we never, ever try to shield him from temptation or guide his affairs in any way. We let him come and go as he pleases, and if he gets drunk, oh well. It's better that he gets drunk and we can find out, because God has either removed his obsession to drink or God has not. And if he hasn't, we need to find out and get to the causes of it. And that was what that guy taught me. Let me go. God had to fix it. He couldn't fix it. No one in AA could fix it for me. God had to remove that obsession. That desire had to come from God. You know, and, uh, and that's what he taught me, and he taught me to be kind to these people that go in and out, relapse and relapse. And I work with a lot of guys that are constant relapsers, man. And nothing makes me pissed than when I see a guy struggling on this disease, man, and he keeps drinking like he had a choice not to drink. Because we don't have a choice when we're out there. It says it. We've lost the power of choice. These people don't have a choice, and they come crawling back in these rooms with all the humility it takes to come crawling back here saying, hey, I got drunk. And some asshole will say, you're not done yet, man. You know what I mean? Or any of that tough, that Charles Bronson tough guy crap, man. I, I, nothing, I can't deal with that. And, uh, and I think back to our program, and I think how our program was based. I think about when Bill Wilson was standing in the Mayflower Hotel, and he's standing there and he feels like drinking. He wants to drink bad. And he's looking, he's got the bar on this side. And he's thinking, man, I could go in the bar and have a couple of drinks. Or I could make a phone call here. So he chooses to make a phone call. Well, what if he made that phone call and he said, hey, I feel like drinking, and the guy on the other end said, then hit it, champ. You know what I'm saying? We wouldn't be here. If you read Dr. Bob's story, the end of Dr. Bob's story, it says, unlike other members of our fellowship, he didn't lose the obsession to drink for years. For years. I wonder if any of those times he ever called Bill Wilson up and said, hey, Bill, I really feel like drinking. And then Bill said, hey, I got five bucks split. You know what I'm saying? Where are we? That's not what our program is based upon. What it says in the book, the only time it talks about drinking, it says, if you don't think you're an alcoholic, go out and take some drinks. Go out and take some because it's worth a bad case of the jitters to find out. But anyway, that's what this guy taught me. And that's just my opinion. And I love sharing that. So anyway, uh, <laughs> that's my opinion. But he taught me to be kind, right? And he taught me that this had to come from God. And I want to talk about that surrender thing, you know. We got natural instincts around here. And I heard this old guy talk, man. And, uh, you know, and he's one of those guys you don't ever want to die. He's like, got a ton you know what I mean? It's like, hey, prop him up in his walker. Do whatever you got to do. Just don't let the guy die, man. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, and so this guy's talking, and I'm taking notes on my arm while he's talking, right? And he said something I never heard. He said, surrender is not an instinct natural to human being. And I was thinking about that. What's he mean, right? What's he mean? It took me some thinking, right? And I looked in the big book. And when we're doing our fourth step in the big book, it talks about our natural instincts gone crazy. Natural instincts gone awry. 
And, uh, and I was thinking, well, what natural instincts do we have as human beings? Just like little human animals, because that's what they're talking about. And we got three major ones. One of them's to find food, another one's to get shelter, and another one's to breathe. And that's just natural little human animal instincts, right? And God did not throw surrender in there. Because let's say we're hungry and we want food and we just say, why give up? I'm not looking for food. Then we die and our species doesn't keep going. On a cold day, if, if we get cold and we just say, well, I'm not finding shelter, boom, we die. Our species does not keep going. And if we don't breed, our species does not keep going. So surrender is not thrown in there. You know, and, and to me, an alcoholic surrendering to this disease is proof of the existence of a higher power. That's somebody stepping in and saying, you're done. You know, and a, and a wonderful example, man, if you ever seen Wild Kingdom on TV, you know, you watch that, you know, and there's like the little gazelles, right, running and the lions after them. Like every time I've watched that show, you know, you see the little gazelle and the lion chasing it. Never once have I ever seen a gazelle turn around, throw up its hoofs and say, fuck it, man. Uh, <laughs> they don't do it, right? You know, they go until they're pulled down. And that's what we do as alcoholics. We go until we're pulled down and some of us die. And that's a fact. Some of us die. And some of us never get this program. And sometimes you hear people say, hey, if I can do it, anybody can do it. That's not true. You know, it's like, I'll come in here, I'll admit to anything. When I was going through a divorce with my wife, we'd be arguing and she'd say, you never loved me. I'd say, yes, I've never loved you. I admit it, right? But it wasn't true. I'm just admitting it. And that's how I felt when I came in here. It's like, yeah, I'm an alcoholic. Sure, whatever. Yeah, addict too. Hey, a dog masturbator. Throw it in, whatever. I'm, you know what I'm saying? It's like... I, I'm in. Yeah, I'm in. Right. But I didn't believe it. I didn't believe it in my heart. I'm not really like you. And since I'm not really like you, I don't got to work these steps and I don't got to go to meetings and I don't got to get involved and I don't have to do any of this stuff because I'm not really an alcoholic. And that's what happened. And to me, I didn't accept in my heart that I was an alcoholic till I had a year and a half sober. God had stepped in and removed the compulsion to drink, but not the obsession. I still had the obsession constantly but I was no longer compelled. Before, when I ran into that bong deal, I was compelled to take a hit. But God had removed that from me, but I still thought about drinking all the time. But I wasn't compelled to do it. I'd just think about it, be in my head, right? I had a year and a half sober, and I heard this guy talk, Scottish Alex, speak. And he was talking, and during his pitch, he said, between drinks was his problem. When he was drinking, he was a hail fellow, well-met kind of guy. And when I heard that, that was me. Between drinks was my problem because I knew how I felt when I got the booze in me. And when I had the booze out of me, that's when I felt worse. I realized that was my problem. And that's when I accepted in my heart that I was an alcoholic. And when I accepted in my heart, that meant that I was willing to do whatever it took to not drink. And they talk about that desire to stop drinking and what it used to be is an honest desire. In our early writings of this thing, it was an honest desire to stop drinking. And they took that out. And now it just says a desire. But there's a big difference between a desire to stop drinking and an honest desire to stop drinking. It's like, I have a desire right now to go to India, but I have not bought a ticket. You know what I'm saying? It's like <laughs> my bags are not packed, and I have not even looked at one travel brochure. But, uh, but I have a desire to go, but it's not an honest desire. And that was the deal with here. Yeah, I have a desire not to drink, but it wasn't an honest desire. And that's what it really takes around here is an honest desire to not drink. You know. And I want to talk about this thing really quick, man. I was afraid of these steps. I was afraid of God when I came in here. You know, I had done a lot of crappy stuff out there. I'd prostituted myself. I raped the church robberies, the grave digging, all this stuff I had done when I was out there, man. And I was afraid. I was afraid. I knew that any God was out there wanted me dead, and he just hadn't gotten around to it yet. You know, and, uh, and I was scared. So what I was taught was to use you guys, was to use the program. On that third step, they told me, don't worry about God. Don't worry about giving your will and your life to God. Give your thoughts and your actions to Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's what I did. There's a story in the Bible, man, and uh, it's told like a bunch of different ways. But the bag is, is this kid's sick. This guy's kid's sick. And Jesus is out in the desert doing all these miracles, healing all these people, right? And, uh, and it, but his kid's too sick to take him there. And so he walks. The dad walks. And he walks all the way. Bam, way, way. Walks, walks, walks all the way through the desert. And he comes up to Christ. And he goes, Rabbi. He goes, will you come home and heal my boy? Come home and heal my boy. He's sick. And if you come there, he'll be healed. And God looked at him and said, go home. Because you believed in me, it's already done. Your son's healed. And that was my experience with that second and third step. I came in here and for some reason I believed in Alcoholics Anonymous. I believed you were sober when you said you were sober. And I said, how do I do it? What did you do to get that time? How did you get 17 years? How did you get a year? How did you get 60 days? What do you do? 
And I did what they did. And I walked that walk through that desert, cleaning coffee pots, picking up cigarette butts, straightening chairs. And all of a sudden, I turned around, and I was healed. I was healed from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body because I believed in you. I believed in the program, and I acted like you acted. And uh, I want to tell you, man, I've had a great life. I owe everything I have to Alcoholics Anonymous, man. And, um, you know, and uh, I'll close with this last thing. And uh, I was at this meeting, and it was a noon meeting. And, uh, and this guy walks in, right, and he comes staggering in. You know, it's like he staggers in. It's noon. It's down on the beach, right? And I'm watching this guy come in, and I'm scared because I see him coming in. And, uh, and he walks in, you know, and he grabs a donut, and he walks over, and he sits down in his chair, and he starts eating the donut, right? And I have a real problem with this guy. And, uh, and I'll tell you, if you like everyone in Alcoholics Anonymous, you're not going to enough meetings. And, uh, <laughs> so anyway, so he grabs a donut, and he starts eating it, right? And I'm looking at him going, oh, man, oh, don't share, don't share, don't share, don't share, right? And I, <laughs> so they start the meeting, and bam, his hand's first up. And I go, oh, Christ, man. And, uh. And the guy starts sharing, and the first word out of his mouth is, I'm miserable. He goes, look at me, and you'll feel much better about yourself. And I thought, oh, my God, I can't listen to this today, man. And he starts going on. Now, if you're new, we got a little pyramid scheme going on around here, and don't buy into it because it's a scam, and I'll tell you why. And uh, It's that, look at this guy. He's got it worse. He's got it worse all the way down, right? You know, he's got it worse than you, so you'll feel better. Well, there's only so many humans in the world, right? <laughs> There's only so many of us. So if you take that worse than you, worse than you, worse than you, it goes all the way down to the last guy. There's that one last guy, right? The worst guy, the last little guy, right? And he can't look over and go, this guy's got it worse, right? He's probably like no arms and no legs laying in a dung pile in India somewhere. What? That last little guy, right? And, uh, and so this guy, I got a little ADD problem, right? So when this guy's sharing, I'm thinking of this last guy. I took the pyramid worse and worse. And I thought, God, there's got to be a last guy, man. And, uh, and I thought, well... Well, when was I that last guy? And I remember when I was that last guy. I had no booze in me one day. I was on the freeway hacking at myself with a razor blade. I drove the car into Long Beach. My daughter was gone. Everything in my life was a shambles. Everything was apart. I had no booze in me. I'm hacking at myself with a razor blade. I drove the car into Long Beach. I parked it at a park. I climbed down in a sewer ditch, and I climbed up this pipe. I climbed way back in the pipe to slit my wrist because I didn't want my family to find my body. That was what happened. I crawled out of there with blood all over me, human waste, just crap all over me, crawled out of there in an alley with that green crap all over me and blood, wandering through an alley. I remember looking up at God and cursing him, saying, F you, for sticking me here in all this pain and not giving me the balls to kill myself. And I was that guy that day, a wretched alcoholic, living with those four horsemen of terror, frustration, bewilderment, and despair on a daily basis, cursing God. And then I thought, okay, let's take the pyramid the other way, up, up, and up. Because we're taught around here to flip it over. So I flipped it over and I took it up. I thought, okay, better, 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 better. When did I have it the best? When have I had it the best out of anyone in the world at that time? And I know when it was. It was with that little girl I had, my 14-year-old now, the drunk. And uh, <laughs> But she wasn't a drunk yet. And uh, she was in seventh grade and she was going to her very first dance. And she'd never been to a dance and she was scared. And she goes, Dad, I don't know what to do. And I go, come on, come on. And I took that little girl into the living room of my house, and I put a slow song on, and I held my daughter in my arms, and I taught my little girl how to dance. And I just held her, and we hugged each other, and we danced. You know, and that's when I had it the best. Nobody in the world had it better than me. And that's what Alcoholics Anonymous has given me. An unbelievable of life, free from the bondage of using and drinking, and I love being sober. I owe everything in the world to you guys, and I want to thank you for having me. Thank you.